Good afternoon. My name is Tara Kelly. I'm Vice President of Development for Monmouth Medical Center, and I welcome you here today. How amazing was this morning? Right? The most inspiring and incredible speakers, I have to say. Monmouth Medical Center is honored to partner and be a recipient from the funds generated today. I have to tell you, we're building an incredible future together. So in 2017, Monmouth Medical Center, just to kind of put things in perspective, spent $1.6 million on free community health education, outreach programs, screenings, Education that went deep into the communities to the people that needed it the most. We touched and were in front of over 76,000 people. How did we do that? All of you were advocates for us. Dollars raised from today help us drive that into the community where it needs to be. Building, creating, Expanding all aspects of healthcare has been a theme of Mammoth Medical Centers for over 130 years. An accomplished regional teaching hospital that we are has provided and continues to provide the highest level of incredible healthcare close to home for everyone. As we all know, Mammoth County is one of the fastest growing counties in New Jersey attracting many young growing families, such as many of you out there, but also attracting a diverse group of people struggling with poverty and healthcare challenges, which is, as we sit in this room, very hard to imagine. The way people access and receive healthcare is changing, it's evolving, and I'm so proud to be a part of it, part of this group, because it's happening here. One of the ways that we demonstrate to millions of people that we serve in healthcare, your families, our community, is essential. Last year, we had over 23,000 admissions to Monmouth Medical Center. We saw 42,000 people walk through our ER. As the third largest hospital in New Jersey with a birth rate, we saw and welcomed 6,000 newborn babies into this world. We are home to 2,300 employees, and for many of you that have walked through our halls and been greeted by a volunteer, we have over 400 active volunteers every day doing incredible things. So as I mentioned, accessibility to quality healthcare remains at the forefront of everything that we do at Monmouth. Partnering with WeForum, partnering with many of our philanthropic leaders, is essential to our overall success and how we have obtained this quickly. Because our community needs it. Our neighbors need this. And I just, I just want to thank each of you for being a part of this, for investing in us, investing in WeFarm, and coming here and learning about these essential skills and educational tools that we all need to have a better tomorrow for ourselves and for our children. So before we welcome Carolyn, who at a cocktail party many years ago, shared this idea with me, and I just stood there in awe. Oh my, how do I bottle this <laughs> up? Um, she will be welcoming and addressing you in just a moment. But if we could take a second and take our eyes to the screens, I'd like to, we'd like to show you a little, a little bit.
coming today. I hope that you enjoyed the full day's program because we have more rock star speakers coming up this afternoon and actually have more programs to offer you this afternoon. So I want to talk a little bit about the title, Eat for Life, How the Power of Food Can Heal Your Body. As our team began to do research and as we began this journey, we realized we wanted more information on how to take care of ourselves. And as we did our research, we were astonished at how many people were sick. So I want you to look around the room, and I want you to look at everybody and imagine that half of the people in this room are going to get a chronic illness due to something that we are doing to ourselves. So then we want to know what was the cause of everything that led, what was the cause of everything, what was it making everybody sick? And that led us to the food system. As we continued our research, that's how we found our speakers, Ron Finley, the gangster gardener, and he's from South Central LA, and Joel Salatin, the lunatic farmer from Virginia, and of course our steam luncheon keynote, Chef David Boulay and Dr. Susan Blum, who you're going to be see in just a few minutes. So food is a big part of our problem, but it's also a part of our solution. We started to take lessons, and we were learning from Ron Finley and Joel Salatin and others, and realized that maybe we needed to start supporting our community and start supporting community gardens. We found gardens in Asbury Park, we've been speaking to people in Red Bank, and that's how we found Long Branch. As state and national leaders in sustainability, Long Branch public school systems are making big strides towards a greener future, while ensuring their students are at the center of every effort. This year, four of their nine schools achieved the highest level of certification in the Sustainable Jersey for Schools program, while the other five buildings achieved bronze level certification. Long Branch is also home to two of the U.S. Department of Education Green Ribbon Schools. Their green team is comprised of very passionate individuals, which include students, teachers, parents, administrators, who are fully committed to making a lasting impact not only on the committee, but the world. With the help of numerous community partners, which include Monmouth Medical Center, the Reform Group, Sustainable, Sustainable Jersey for Schools, and many others, Long Branch is able to spearhead a number of other green projects, including the expansion of their school gardens, energy saving programs, and nutrition education. I am proud to say that Monmouth Medical Center has provided generous donations to Long Branch School District to help with their gardens and hydroponic growing towers. Diego Diaz is the SME Sustainability Officer at Long Branch School System. He's here with Sarah Hansen, who's the principal of one of their schools. They brought their green team, and I would like to ask these teachers to stand up and be recognized for the good work they're doing. We are proud to provide you with support. Please give them a round of support. Thank you very much for all that you do for our children. If you, if you can take the time to look at your donor cards on the table, and if you can donate, please try to donate to Monmouth Medical Center. We are proud to support their free programs for education and health and wellness programs. They are free and accessible to everybody in our community. That's right, free, and they serve nearly 100,000 people. Okay, so without further ado, I would like to introduce our host, Alexis. Forgive me if I'm repetitive, but she is due a second introduction. She's the CEO of Gen Youth Foundation, a nonprofit organization that is dedicated to nurturing child health and wellness through programs presented in partnership with the National Football League and the National Dairy Council. Alexis helped to launch the Fox Business Network, where she served as VP of the Business News and anchored Money for Breakfast. Glenn previously served as anchor on NBC's Today Show and CNBC's Squawk Box. And she's also my very dear friend. Please welcome Alexis Glick. Good afternoon, and uh, thank you for letting me join you again for uh, for the afternoon program. This morning was wonderful. Um, I don't know about you, but I learned an enormous amount this morning uh, about how we can deal and think about prevention, how we can think about our whole body, how we should treat the soil and the farmland, and how some of the things that you just saw, saw in that beautiful video should incite us into action, particularly as it relates to the next generation. Carolyn and I have been friends for a long time. 
Uh, we met just after my first couple of kids were born and before her three were born. And I think back and I look at many familiar faces in the room, Debbie, who we work with in our Morgan Stanley days, and Melissa, where we met each other back on the Today Show. And, um, and I'm reminded of you know, something that um, I've heard Dr. David Satcher, the former Surgeon General, uh, teach me. He was the Surgeon General during both the Clinton and the Bush administration. And one of the things he said is, Alexis, we're in a constant state of learning. And he's in his late 80s. And I so appreciate that because I think what today is all about is that we need to be in a constant state of learning. And we need to recognize that there's more we can do and that we can inspire others in our practices. Melissa and I were just doing a Facebook Live interview and she looked at me at one point and she said, okay, so you're running this health and wellness program, you know, a kid from Wall Street, a kid who spent a little less than a decade in media, like, how do you do it? Like, how do you, what do you want other parents to know about what you tell these 40 million kids a day that you reach in schools across the United States? And I said to Melissa, it's really simple. We need to practice what we preach. So if we're telling our kids that they need to start their day with a healthy breakfast, that they need the fuel to succeed in the classroom, then we've got to do that. We've got to demonstrate to them that, to them that that's important. If we believe there's a crisis in physical inactivity, which as I shared with some of you earlier this morning, 4% of elementary school students, 8% of middle school students, 3% of high school students have daily physical activity, daily PE as we know it. That's a crisis. So what are we gonna do about it? We gotta figure out how can we ensure that our kids get active for up to 60 minutes a day, even if that's before, during, and after school. How do we do that? Well, as moms, I said to Melissa, you know how many sidelines I've stood on at a hockey game, at a lacrosse game, at a football game? And I kinda got to the point and I looked and I said, you know what? It's about time that I get as much of that physical activity as I can squeeze in because I've got to build my house. And by building my house, I'll be much better able to build my kid's house and to protect and empower the kids around me. So I think the biggest thing I would say about taking away from today is you're learning so much, the best leading experts in the room. There's more we can do. And it starts in your communities. And it starts working side by side. I've met many of you in the room today, and I'm emboldened by what an incredible community this is, that you're empowering those in your school buildings to make a difference because those statistics should shake you to the core. Now, the best part about today uh, is my opportunity to introduce to you the lunchtime speakers. I'm so excited because I know Carolyn, she's amazing, and um, she goes into this like world-renowned restaurant, and she just figures, I'm gonna go, um, I'm gonna go recruit one of you know the best chefs in the world to you know come and be a part of my leaf worm, because that's Carolyn. She's unstoppable. And so she walks into um, you know, just David Boulay's restaurant and uh, to you know this incredible chef. And she's inspired by him and thinks, I'm gonna leave some information. And in the process learns about how he took time off, closed this world-renowned restaurant to travel the world to learn more about food and the critical ingredients that go into food. And from there, took lessons about how do, do his consumers react and what does the future of food look like, particularly for someone in his position. And it is through that that he has now created the Boulay Home and Test Kitchen and he is the inspiration for today's luncheon talk. It is based off of um, dining lectures that he has frequently done. In fact, they're called the Chef and the Doctor series. And one of those doctors that he's done the series with is a very influential doctor, Dr. Suzanne Blum, who has worked in anti-inflammatory and autoimmune disorders, disorders. And her goal is simple. How do we educate? How do we empower you? And how do we make sure that you learn how to heal yourself? And she's here to help you do it. So without further ado, it is my great honor to introduce to you Dr. Chef David Boulay, uh, Dave, Chef David Boulay and Dr. Suzanne Blum. Thank you. It's an honor to be here with all of you. And it's true, Carolyn is uh, quite impressive. I wanted to see her today because I can't remember what she looked like, but I still have her energy in my head. 
So she seduced me to come out here and talk to other folks. So let me tell you a bit about my history and how I got to what I've been doing. I'm one of nine children. My mother raised nine children, then she got a PhD in child psychology, early child education, and she opened four Montessori schools. So that was my cornerstone of understanding how food and communication can be successful. So on my French side, I have uncles who are holistic doctors. And in the 70s, when I was a student in France, they used to teach me about American doctors. They would say, they say, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And I couldn't really record that when I came back here because I didn't really know how people would accept it. But they'd also say that food is great pleasure, food is productive calories, and food is a cure. So over the years now, since I've opened Boulay in 87, I had to cook to give people energy. And I learned how to do that quite well from a digesting point. Food that made people get back to the office where they didn't run to the coffee machine or to the soda machine, they weren't crashing. Just like a woman two nights ago said to me, David, I just told my husband I'm gonna to walk to 82nd Street West End tonight because I eat twice as much food here and usually I, here I have more energy. I eat half as much and I fall asleep on my husband's shoulder on the way home. So these are what I've heard for, for years and years and years. It was basically how did I feel about the food that I was serving, how did I digest the food myself. So I had mastered this energy style of cooking, but about 15 years ago when something arrived called autoimmune problems, I realized that we had to know more about the science of food. So I started to study more and more of how I can cook for folks. And in a minute I'll show you some of the things that we call a living pantry, which I'm writing a book called Living Pantry. And it'll be also an internet site where you go to, you'll see the products that are available in season. You'll understand that there are a criteria of cost, time, or skill. And then it will teach you technique, and then it will help bring you to another app, and that app will be quantifying the ingredients. Why are these ingredients more powerful, and how do they service my body? And then finally, before you see the recipe, there'll be something called, well, actually, I have about 40,000 cookbooks, I've never seen it, but when I buy a vacuum cleaner, there's five pages of it, it's called Trouble Shooting. <laughs> Why is no cookbook telling you how to get out of trouble? So you get to the finish line, and actually be happy, build confidence, start cooking, everyone's gonna think you're a genius, everyone's gonna get healthy. Just like those folks in the first boulet from Wall Street used to bring in their wives and doctors and say, those folks would say to me, what are you doing to him? He's eating five times a week in your restaurant, he's losing weight, he's healthier, the doctors are surprised with their blood markers, and all their colleagues are saying, He's a much nicer guy to work with now. What are you doing to him? So we realize that food has a service beyond just flavor. The problem is that our food has become too convenient and too shelf-stable. So NHK, which is like the BBC of Japan, we've been doing a documentary now for two years on the centennials, the blue zones. And on the finish of the video, you'll see an area in Okinawa. Now these people are unbelievable. They're just, they're, I had to cook a lunch for everybody that was over 100, and all the women came on bicycles. You will see it on the video next year, the, the documentary. They're just living a simple life, but they don't have such a crowded life. They have more time to think about better choices of food. And as many people are saying, and I'm sure you heard today from brilliant people in the health and medical practice, that food is a complete conversation to your DNA. Every time you eat food, it's telling your body to do something good or do something bad. You have to learn from your body and not learn from your neighbor or your friend or even your sister or your iPhone. Listen to your body. This is what I learned from France on my uncles who are holistic doctors. They're all in the late 90s now. They never seem to die that side of the family. But they, they live on a certain list of principles. Enjoy food, 
pick the best quality that you can find and celebrate. And just like not long ago, we had the English on one side of my oven and the French on the other side of the oven, and they were talking about a book that was just released about the French diet. Why don't they have so much problem with obesity? And the English folks were, because I'm in the middle of this cooking, it was a big law firm, and I feel the crossfire going back and forth. And I feel that English people finally send a, a bomb to the French. Oh, you French, you eat cheese and butter and fried rice and drink so much wine and you have the lowest obesity. And the French response was, well, that, that's true. We pick the highest quality. We eat the smallest portion. We eat the largest number of foods in a week. But all of them answered as, as a chorus, we enjoy it. So you can't be afraid of food. And I feel that as a chef talking to so many people at Boulay at home, I find people are afraid of food. They also generalize food. And I always say to people, here you go again, generalizing food. What does that mean? They'll ask me about salt. And I'll say, well, there's salt they put on the street. And then there's a few levels up, and that's the salt in fast food. And then there's Himalayan and Celtic salt. And those salts can actually reduce blood pressure because they stimulate respiratory activity. They have 84 minerals. How can you generalize salt when most of the fast food is using sodium chloride? Then they'll talk about fats and oils. We try to explain to them what are good fats, what are high metabolism fats. And if you read The Big Fat Surprise by Nina, you'll understand that we need fats. In the area of judgment of fats being bad is over. We have learned that we've been being polluted with sugar and salt. So we need to find higher quality, energetic, metabolizing, good quality fats. Then I'll talk about sugars, and I'll say, there you go again, generalizing. There's all kinds of sugars. So what kind of sugars do we need? Get the sugars that are in the natural product. So let me start the video, and I'm gonna actually walk over and be a pointer, and then I'll come back here and complete what I've learned in my two years of studying about longevity and what some of the women over 100 in Japan have been teaching me. So I'm gonna walk, we'll start the video. So B is on class. Can everybody hear me? So B is on class. Just means put in place. So here we have Himalayan salt, which is extremely healthy salt. We have to have that in our pantry. We just put the vanilla bean inside because the vanilla bean is both prebiotic and probiotic. It's not not only used in sugar. It has a lot of health benefits to our microbiome. It also calms us like lavender. So we buy a good vanilla bean on the internet from Tahiti or one of the better beans in the world, and we get an incredible amount of use out of it because it's expensive. This pepper is very good because the whole kitchen will smell like pepper and vanilla. Now vanilla oil, we can put that on a slice of tomato with some raspberry vinegar, sit down, and clearly you are going to talk to yourself for 10 minutes. I made this, this is amazing, I'm a genius. So these kinds of things are the building blocks. We have now currently almost 3,000. We're gonna to get to about 5,000. It seems like a lot of things, but those oils will last over a year. So you take a little bit of time from your crowded life and you build a living pantry of building blocks that you can execute very quickly. Now garlic, anti anti oxidant, anti-inflammatory, and cancers. What is that on the spatula? That is caramel sugar from the garlic. Sugar isn't everything. We don't need to add sugar to anything. We have to learn how to get the water out so we have caramelization. So you can imagine this garlic oil is sweet and has a great perfume. Lemon verbena kills parasites and helps our metabolism on contact. That's why the French will always ask you after dinner, the Germans, the Italians, do you want an infusion? This will help you digest. Lemon verbena is used mostly in tea. We make the lemon verbena oil. And most of these, when they get into a fat medium, they will pass through our organs. Unlike a tea or other things, when we go to the bathroom, it's left. 
So a lot of these things have to be in a fat medium. Mint oil. We learned a lot about this when I started to cook for people with Crohn's disease. This helped a lot of women who were scared to come to the table, sometimes even in tears. We were getting hugs and kisses after 12 courses because I was learning things like this can help support the mucus lining is where they're having a problem with health. So it's very simple to make something like this. We keep it in the refrigerator and then we execute it under our own design, under all of your own design. There's no recipe to follow. Curry. The Indi as Dr. Steve, who did a chef and doctor, a neurologist from President of Cornell, this is turmeric. India has the lowest Alzheimer's disease in the world. You guys eat the most curry. In curry is turmeric. In turmeric is curcumin. Now in India, they put it in ghee, and then it goes into the recipe. Curcumin and turmeric is fat soluble. It has to be in a fat medium. You can't just peel turmeric, throw it in the blender, and drink it. Think by tomorrow afternoon you're gonna be healthy. It's not how it works. It has to be in a fat medium. You make a curcumin oil or turmeric oil and it's there for you to use. Now, garlic, we all should be eating a lot more of that. I don't think anybody's gonna debate the benefits, but how do we use it? We create a garlic puree, and as an 80-year-old woman taught me a number of years ago in my cooking classes, she said, David, I'm a tiny little person, I eat by myself, I can't put it in those big blocks in the frozen ice cream tray. I, lean, I lay it in a Ziploc baggie, make it very thin, put it in the freezer, and break out what I want. So you can see how soft it is, it's like soft butter. Garlic, the more we cook it, the more we diminish the nutrient benefits. So we've sent it to Cornell, they quantified what my temperature was with the highest nutritional values. We turn this into a garlic puree. Most people that taste it think it's pine nut or something else, they can't believe how good garlic can taste. And we know it has the nutritional density. So all these green, full of polyphenols and other good benefits, nitric oxide, all the things that we need for our bodies, how do we work with this at home besides a pesto? We see it at the store. So we just blanched it. By blanching, we take the water out of the leaf, even though it's in water, so that when we blend it, the water won't heat up and change the color, oxidation. So we squeeze out the water, we put it in the blender, we put cold oil on top, and we use buffered vitamin C, which is one of the best food preservatives, I think, still in the world. It gives a higher color, a long stability of time in your refrigerator, and a lot more flavor. A, a Yale professor taught me this about 25 years ago when he made too much pesto, and his neighbors closed the doors and locked the doors and pulled the blinds down because Henry was bringing more pesto. So he needed to keep it fresh in the freezer and it worked really well. Parsley. This was in the 80s when I didn't want to work with dairy anymore. I wanted to have a lot of tree trunk sauces. Parsley water. It's so simple. Wilt it. A little bit of honey. Throw the ice in. Put it right away in the blender. This is like a green latex paint that you can do anything with. And it's full of the polyphenols and all the good benefits of B vitamins, everything that you would find in green. But when I sent the Cornell, Ray Glon sent me back three weeks later, papers written about breast cancer in parsley water. So look at that, same color. How does that happen? Everything that we cook that's green turns brown and tastes horribly. So we cook it for a certain time, we move enzymes, we have no oxidation. So all these things I had to cook last year and I had to teach uh, a lecture in San Diego in front of a psychiatrist about fight and flight. Dr. Musk in the Columbia asked me to lecture. First time to have a chef ever lecturing in 15,000 psychiatrists. So I studied these ingredients. So you know all that. Dr. Oz and Oprah have made everything famous. And you don't know what to do with it. So we're making a dressing just like a French dressing. You put the pumpkin seed in, the vinegar, the spirulina or corella, and then we emulsify it with the cod liver oil. This cod liver oil tastes really good. It's not the one that has to hold the nose. This man is 105 years old. I walked out with him because we had a lunch there and I asked him, please tell me four things. And his four things were calm, 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 11 times he said. 
22 times he said community like this. And then he said, do what you love and never stop. And finally, if you're smelling food and you're happy, tasting food and you're happy, digesting food are happy, and you're two hours later you're happy, that's the food to eat. So all this is based on bacteria. This is black vinegar, which we have 250,000 bottles. It's a 200 year old family. That's where Brock has got a lot of information from the benefits of bacteria and their apple cider. This one you can buy in the market now. It's Okinawa spinach. It's a mega fruit. We have it available. What is their diet? Full of omega. A lot of people have problems with folate. A lot of people have a problem with iodine. You're going to get that from those kind of foods. And this goes back 800 years. It's impressive that they still would use food going back 800 years today. <laughs> so, basically, where are we now with food? You see the living pantry. You take a little bit of your time from your schedule, which is already very crowded and you build these blocks with your families and you execute them under your own design. Well, then will function. That garlic puree, I mean, so you can do anything with that. A lot of these building blocks you'll build, have them available, and you're gonna throw away everything that's no longer living. Our pantries are full of what I call dead food. We have a lot of stories that I could spend talking to over a whole week. One of them, a couple of them are family. We had a family member who had two tumors three years ago who was married to a French man, but she's a professor here, and they gave her two months. And so we got into action, my wife and I. We got her home. Uh, they couldn't believe she was getting stronger. She cooked, this was in August. She cooked Thanksgiving dinner. She later went for an MRI in January, which they didn't think she'd be alive. <coughs> They found only two pin-sized tumors where they were. They went back in February and did another MRI, and they found nothing, both bone and lung. And as she put it, eight doctors put her in a room, and one with a very long finger said, you tell us what you've been doing. So we know that food can change. I had to go to the house. I threw away a lot of food that shouldn't be there. We learned that we had to build her strength, we had to build her microbiome, her mitochondria. We gave her energy back. I taught her how to do simple things. She's been doing healthier cooking. This is three years now, and she's a perfect, unbreakable health she has today. So we're learning. We're also learning. I don't know whether someone's going to tell me when I have to stop talking. Uh, where do I look at that person? Okay, okay, I have two minutes, okay. We're also learning, when I opened Boulay at home, I had two professors from an Ivy League college with their wives, and they were in their 70s, and they had a sense of humor, we laughed through the night. And I gave them books on health at the end, and they said, we're economists. I said, that's okay. And I, I said to them, why don't we have a verbal contract? Why are we gonna do that, they asked me. I said, we're gonna build a team on health. You two and your wives. Great, what are we gonna do? I said, tomorrow you have to get your blood tested. Because when I started the Chef and Doctor series, I learned on a radio station with 30 million people listening one time, one of the doctors read his, his blood marker test the next day after Valentine's Day with his wife and he had 14 courses. And all the doctors challenged him. So I knew that they might be surprised. They left. Two days later, day four, they're back. And I came over to say hello to them. Thanks for coming back. They said, we honored your contract. I didn't know what they were talking about. I completely forgot. And they looked at me and said, our doctor says it appears that you know what you're talking about. <laughs> Triglycerides were in the 60s. HDL was very high. LDL was very low. But most surprising, their sugar was stable. And I think that has a lot to do with the products I've been bringing from Japan. I have one minute. Great. So, I got a lifetime achievement from Dr. Green at Cornell, at Columbia for gluten, and from Dr. Smith as well as at Cornell. And last year I got a lot of PhD from UConn, I had to speak to the students. I basically wanted to tell them congratulations on the Foundation of Education. I have 22 minutes to talk about a Foundation of Health. I have about 30 seconds to tell you what I told them. So basically, I want to make sure they're listening. So I said to them, 
Let me read a line from Mark Twain, 1857. Beware of health books, you may die from a misprint. And of course they all laughed. Now I have them listening, 70, 800 of them. And I told them at Kmart you can buy a glycemic index for $26. And after your meal, if your sugar is high, your food didn't service you. You can buy a, a heart rate monitor for $65. And two hours later, if your heart rate is fluctuating, you have a digestion problem. You have to fix these things until you don't need your toolbox anymore and you're gonna feel how food makes you feel. So my goal is to get that living pantry into all of your home, get you to execute these, these building blocks that are full of nutritional value under your own design. You'll own it, you'll have fun, and you're all gonna get healthy, and we're gonna be cooking and building communities again. My goal is to make it taste good, and also my goal is to break down the barriers between the health practitioners, the food industry, and all of you. We have lots of silos of success. They're everywhere, but they're not integrated. We have to get everyone together as one community and all work together. And that's why when Caroline told me what she was doing, I was so excited. And that's why I'm so happy to actually meet her today, because I can remember what she looked like. Because her energy was like, we're gonna do this. We're gonna do it all together. And so I wanna thank you all for listening. And please welcome Susan Malone. jump right in because we're wasting time. Um, functional medicine physician, I have, uh, I'm the founder and director of Blum Center for Health. I'm, a wet, I'm in New York, uh, Westchester, but we're all metro New York people, right? We're all uh, similar in terms of, uh, you know, the things we're interested in perhaps, and native New Yorkers is how I think of myself. You're from the West Coast, sorry. That's right, some people did fly in, so we're not all from here. Um, so from wherever you are, welcome. But I'm, I'm in Westchester, and uh, I, have, I have a health center where we all practice integrative and functional medicine, and I have a big teaching kitchen in, at Blum Center where we teach people how. And one of the things I, you know, I sit and I'm mesmerized by listening to Chef Boulay, and I've had the opportunity to hear him speak many, many times when we do our Chef and Doctor series together. And, um, and gosh, I'm just teaching people the skills. We want to help you, help you be able to do it. It's one thing to give people a food list and say, here you go. Just go do it, you know, but it's really hard. You have to learn tools, you have to learn pantry, you know, how to help stop your pantry. And I'm teaching people how to cook, and so does he, actually. Um, he's in New York City doing that, you can take cooking classes at his place. And um, at Blum Center, we're teaching cooking classes as well. And so, skill building, teaching you how, but also teaching you why. One of my favorite sayings, and for those of you in my lecture earlier, you already, in my presentation earlier, you already heard this, but, the goal is to teach you how to fish and not just give you a fish. And so learning how to choose food includes sort of teaching you why we're telling you to choose these foods. And so I was asked to, I'm sorry for you on the ends, I have to stay in the middle. And so I was asked to um, come and talk, we're going to switch gears a little bit, and I'm going to look quickly because I really um, wish I didn't have slides now. I love the conversational talk. But what we're going to do is just go quickly through some information that I want to share with you, and then we're going to, uh, Chef Pillay and I are going to just sit and do questions and answers and have a conversation, which is really the, you know, what I'm really hoping we'll have plenty of time to get to. Okay, so those are all the things that I do. I'm involved in all this, you know, um, what was it you said, uh, chronic busyness, or how did you refer to that? We're all really busy and doing too much, and I'm probably, uh, 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 a crowded life. Um, but I, I think it's really important that as we talk about food and digestion and everything that's involved with culture and loving food, I, we sit down for meals in my house, I meditate in the morning, so I have a crowded life, but I really set the intention for a balanced life. So I think we can have a crowded life and yet find balance, and I think that's really important for all of us here in this room, because ultimately that's going to be key for your health for sure. So we're going to get to that. So this is my first book. This is what's inspired this talk. We're just going to talk a little bit about the immune system. This is a four-step program for treating autoimmune disease. We know that we're living in an autoimmune epidemic. Chef Boulay also talked about that being this one of his inspirations for really learning about the effect of food in the body. Um, so functional medicine, Most of the, a lot of you uh, raise up hands. Who, actually let's do it the other way. Who does not know what functional medicine is? Yeah. <laughs> 
So I don't need to tell you. But so if you know about functional medicine, which is about finding and treating the root cause of illness, um, then you already know that we're looking at food as we, we look upstream, right? We're looking for all the things that might be triggering and causing illness. Um, my background is preventive medicine. So I'm board certified in preventive medicine. I'm on faculty at Mount Sinai in that department. And prevention, true prevention, is preventing illness. <laughs> not just early detection, like go get a mammogram or go get a pap smear. That's what conventional medicine thinks of as, as prevention. But true prevention is way upstream. So when you think of a river, it starts upstream in the mountains, and then it winds its way down, and you have symptoms way down at the bottom. And you have a disease at the bottom. But the top of the river, upstream, is where the river begins. And so if you go way upstream, functional medicine, we're upstream medicine, trying to figure out where this all starts. And food is the number one place that you have to start because it has the power to cause disease, reverse disease. And so the work that we're doing is always trying to understand why from every angle, right? And so helping you choose food and helping bring back food that inspires the body to be healthy as opposed to otherwise. And so, so yeah, so food is that. And so we're going to talk about how, we're going to talk about the immune system a little bit, right? So I promised I would talk about immune health and how, you know, lifestyle sort of plays into it. Well, one of the things I am going to spend a little time talking about, because this is where I think David and I can have a really nice discussion with all of you, is the food and the gut microbiome. And what we're learning about that intersection. And some of the work he's doing is just so fascinating. I love talking about that. So here's the idea. If you knew, and all of you here know this, so if you knew that changing the food you eat or making some simple changes would have the power to give you more energy, more focus, help reverse your health concerns, um, and improve your gut microbiome, improve your ability to detoxify and remove toxins from your body, improve you know, a health condition if you have it, you know, with, and reduce inflammation and help support your immune system so you didn't get sick all the time. This isn't just about having one immune disease. This is how do we support our immune system, because our immune function is the, the, sort of the foundation for where inflammation comes from. And if you knew that changing your food could change all that, would you do it? And then the answer is absolutely most, you know, think we would all say yes. But there are a lot of challenges to dietary change, and, and I love what you were just talking about, about talking about gratitude. And, you know, there's so much more about food, and so this, this you know, there's choosing food and culture and all that, which is important. But I want to just sort of acknowledge amongst us that even as we're talking and making our food list and like we should do this and we should do that, and our society and our culture, we want to teach people how to do it, there are a lot of challenges to doing this. You know, there are simple things like just food costs. Not everybody can afford organic and, and the kinds of food that we're talking about we want people to eat. There are food deserts where you can't even find this stuff. Um, we're very privileged in this area where we live, that we can find this stuff, but not everybody can. Um, and, and then the whole working people, which is why I love this, what Chef Filet is you know, working on, which is having ready things in your pantry that are nutrient dense, that our food is medicine, that you can just use in your cooking really easily to sort of upgrade your whole meal, right? And so working with time constraints are a big issue. And then the other thing is, you know, and this is very important because I recently gave a talk about to a group, and a lot of a lot of people were just talking and speaking to the issue that they're doing all, the, they think they're doing everything right, but yet they're still struggling with their health and still struggling with their weight. And so, you know, sometimes there's other things going on. It's not just about maybe you are eating healthy already, but you're still struggling. And so that's what we're going to talk about other potential triggers on your immune system or problems with your immune system that are um, secondary, perhaps, to the diet that might also be troubling you. So sometimes you're doing everything right, but you're still struggling. And so that's where functional medicine really shines. Okay, so using functional medicine. So I'm going to move a little sort of quickly through this. This is the, so one of the things Chef Poulet said about um, the way we eat and uh, the, the genetic expression. So there's a, a, something called nutrigenome. And the idea is this, that actually food is information. You bring the food in, and the research now tells us, we have tons of, tons of research now, um, explaining and studying how the, the food, different components of food, causes the expression of genes in our cells. And so in every single cell, there's sort of, you have your full genetics, or your whole body in every cell in your body. And then we call that the book of life, right? This is just an analogy. 
But in certain cells and in certain conditions, a chapter will open. So if you eat certain foods, the inflammation chapter might be triggered to open in a certain cell, and you will end up releasing inflammatory chemicals. And so inflammation can be driven that way. So we call it sort of which chapter is going to be read in your book of life in your cells is determined by the foods you eat have a really big influence on that. There are other factors as well, but food is certainly something we can control and is one of the main triggers for unhealthy and, and, and inflammation being released. And so this is called nutrigenomics, and this is just like a picture of it. So if you imagine eating blueberries, they're going to go into your cell, and cause the you know the cells to be really healthy because of the phytonutrients in the blueberry. On the other hand, if you eat something that you don't know what it is, <laughs> and that's going to go into your cells, and that's going to trigger inflammation or it's going to trigger unhealthy behavior by the cell. And so this whole idea that the cal calories are not equal. You know, 100 calories of you blueberries and 100 calories of that are going to behave, trigger a reaction in your cells that are driven at the deepest genetic level. And that's a field called nutrigenomics. And so we know now that food is information. And so what does it mean? And actually, he went through this, so I'm going to skip right through this because he talked about what happens when you eat too much sugar. You know, what do you want to be eating? Well, the kind of healthy fats and a lot of antioxidants and a nutrient-dense, nutrient-rich food plan and not having the fast foods and getting rid of the processed foods. And um, I'm not going to spend time talking about food sensitivities because I want to get move on. But um, some people, it's important to determine for yourself if you have any food sensitivities. That's where the gluten might come in. And so we always recommend testing yourself by removing certain foods and then reintroducing them. Um, but that, that's that part. We're going to talk later about cultured foods. I think that's a place that he and I are going to have a great conversation around. Um, I, you know, I think uh, anti-cultured foods, and we're going to talk about that too. I have a whole gut section that I want to get to. But cultured and fermented foods are really, really important for your immune system. Uh, the gut microbiome is key, and we're going to get to that next. So, not everybody understands about what it means to, be, to eat whole foods, and so I think you in this room do understand that, and that's good. Um, but, you know, whole food looks like you picked it from the ground. It's not been processed and changed in any way. And so really helping you learn how to make those choices is key. And so I'm just going to roll right through these. So it's sugar, it's choosing your fat. Um, there's something called oxidative stress, which is, um, it's sort of the balance of your body. So, so every day you make free radicals and you are regular biochemistry every day. So you're making um, free radicals are just the end product of, think of them like little embers inside your cells. So your mitochondria are making energy and you make free radicals, and then you eat antioxidants and you put it out. So nature gave us an abundance of antioxidants to put out the fire. It's, it's part of our normal everyday biochemistry. But under certain circumstances, you can see that you might end up getting behind in your antioxidants or having too many free radicals, and you can have that happen because you have too many toxins that you're exposed to, or you have too much stress, or your gut microbiome's not healthy, and there are all sorts of reasons why you can be eating toxins in your food, and eating unhealthy fats, and that increases your free radicals. And so you end up with a situation where the free radicals are running them up, and you end up with little fires, which we call oxidative stress. Now, oxidative stress is an underlying cause of inflammation, and oxidative stress really causes damage to your immune system. Your immune cells are always busy working. They're like little army soldiers. And they're busy and they, they need to recover from their activity every day and they need a lot of antioxidants. And so food is the number one best way of getting enough antioxidants to make sure you don't have oxidative stress in your body. Um, and so eating a lot of color and a lot of plants. And so food rich in antioxidants, I'm just going to do that. Um, the next category, though, in addition to antioxidants from food, and this is where I love things like mushrooms, and, you know, they're foods that we call immunomodulators. They're influencers. They're not a specific antioxidants in how they work. They just influence the functioning of your immune system. And this is where um, probiotics are stars. And, you know, it's really interesting. We, you know, probiotics you can take as a pill, but, you know, Chef Poulet, and we'll talk about that a little more later. My voice, this is my second lecture, so my voice is getting a little tired. Um, but um, 
you can eat cultured and fermented foods as a way to get probiotics in, and actually we both advocate that as a way to, you know, cultures around the world have eaten foods with bacteria, you know, for thousands of years. I mean, that's the way man always supported their microbiome. And so probiotics, they're not seeds. You know, a lot of people think, like, you eat them, they're like a seed, and you plant a flower, and it grows. They're not, that's not really how they function. They influence the ecosystem of your whole gut. They influence your immune system. They talk to the immune system as it's developing along your intestinal tract. They talk to your lymphoid tissue. They, they improve the functioning of your T regulators. They, they, they're influencers. They influence the other, all the other bacteria that are there to be healthier. They influence the health of the intestinal lining. So they're influencers, which is why, and they only live for six weeks after you eat them or ingest them, we believe, and they pass through, which is why they have to be part of your diet. You have to feed them every day. You have to be always, in, always bringing them in because they're going to influence your immune system. People say to me, what's the single, what, what, what supplement should I take for the winter if I think I'm getting sick or I'm worried? I tell them to take a probiotic. <laughs> it's actually suppressing inflammation. They, they reduce inflammation and they support the functioning of your immune system. Separate from planting seeds and growing. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right, so five more minutes. So I want to move on then to, so vitamin D, a very recent study on vitamin D is the best immunomodulator, really important for the functioning of your immune system. There was a recent study that just came out that said, vitamin D doesn't do anything. You know, people start calling me and emailing me. And um, the thing is that be wary of reading population-based studies because in a population of 50,000 people, vitamin D might not have cured a disease. But we all know that you need to have a target. There are many, many, many studies on what vitamin D does for your immune system. And everyone has a target of, we know we want your vitamin D to be above 50, let's say, your levels in the blood. And so, especially for women, preventing osteoporosis. And so, personalized medicine. You know your number, take vitamin D to get yourself above that number. Don't read those studies that are just a population. Okay? Vitamin D is critical for the immune system. Vitamin A is really important for the immune system, but I always list the food, right? So using food is In a plant-based diet, you're going to get all these nutrients. Vitamin D, you won't. Um, there's vitamin D2 in mushrooms, right? But the body has trouble converting it over to vitamin D3. Um, and then uh, green tea, there's a lot more kinds of studies. Like, you really can find studies on almost all antioxidants that you and of course, mushrooms. Mushrooms are the greatest immunomodulator. Um, and we'll have Chef Boulay tell us the actual chemicals in the mushrooms, but I gave you a couple there um, of the studies that show that. Um, but I want to spend the last five minutes on the gut, because I, wanna, I know you've had a lot of gut discussions today, this morning so far, but it is that important. I only, I, if you think of nothing else, just think, we oh, go home and remember, a healthy gut is a healthy immune system. 70% of the immune system lives uh, I'm not, I don't have time to sort of go through that, but there's a picture of your, your digestive tract. Small intestine, 10% of the microbes live there, 90% live in the large intestine. Stomach's a sterilizing compartment, pH 1.5. Really, really important for the health of this microbiome in your intestines, that your stomach pH is good and acid. So if you're on antacids or taking antacids, you need to get off of those, really important. But the point I want to make for our discussion today, which is about food, Right, is that food is the number one most influential factor that determines the health of your microbes. You take a carnivore, you take a vegetarian, their microbiomes look completely different. Within 24 hours of swapping their diets, their, their microbiome starts changing. And so any change you make, if you want to have a permanent change in your health and your microbiome, it needs to be permanent. Right, so therapeutic food plans are, are really good when you're sick and you want to try something intense, like a ketogenic diet or something. But ultimately, you want to move towards eating a lot of plants because plants are what's ultimately going to help you have a healthy gut. Um, this just always reminds me about this whole hygiene hypothesis. Like, we were meant to eat dirt. We were meant to eat, you know, bring in bacteria from the earth. I mean, we, we need all that. It tones our immune system. Um, I already sort of spoke to this about the flora and all the things it does for us. Uh, but the immune function is really, really important. 70% of your immune system is in your intestinal lining. That's a lot, okay? And so the health of your microbiome really does determine the health of your immune system, which is why, um, you know, in autoimmunity and the work helping people heal from autoimmunity and going upstream in functional medicine, we do so much healing the gut work. So it's really central to what we do. 
Um, but I listed for you what, you know, fermented, the bacteria ferment the food you're eating and they make this thing called short-chain fatty acids, which in themselves, those compounds are healing and, and support immune function and help the immune system work right. So it's this whole ecosystem that's designed to help you have a healthy immune system. Um, yeah, and so what's the best way to do this? I just talked about, I already explained this to you, but it's important to bring in cultured foods, and I think that will be a good discussion for us. Cultured foods are when you actually add bacteria to, and then culture of the food, and fermented foods, he's gonna, he's gonna fix this for me, and I'm gonna explain this. But um, fermented foods are foods that you that sit and they naturally grow their own bacteria, right, Dave, did I get that right? Okay, whereas cultured food, you add like a starter, you know, bacteria to it. And so these are foods that you have, that we're gonna sort of help brainstorm how to get into your diet. My favorite thing these days, and I told this to my class, the, the, the group I was speaking to before, but I take fermented vegetables, and I take a fork full, and I, put, I eat it with dinner every night. I take it and put it on my plate, and I just eat it, and I don't take a probiotic every day. You know, a supplement, I just get it in my food. Um, but I'm dairy free, so I don't do kefir and yogurts of, of you know dairy kind, and so instead I do it with my with my vegetables, and I use fermented vegetables. And so I just love these pictures, though. It's just a reminder that we're so you know this is this whole idea about how does, how do we end up with a gut, healthy gut microbiome? How does it start? You know, when we um, the whole idea of C-sections and clean and we're too clean when the kids are young and like letting really having the exposure to, you know, infectious and microbial organisms helps tone the microbiome and, and, and get you started um, in life, yeah. And so I'm actually not going to have time to talk about this, but when the microbiome is out of balance, this is this thing called the leaky gut, which a lot of you know about, I took a poll already, and a leaky gut is where inflammation starts from the gut, because when the intestinal lining is damaged, you can see on the top there that uh, the, the, the microbes and the food antigen, the pieces of food, can slip into the body and it sort of triggers an immune reaction. And so this is um, how one of the ways we believe autoimmunity can start because the, and how people get food sensitivities because from the damage in the gut, the, uh, the, the slippage and the leaking of all these proteins into the body causes just the immune system to become really dysfunctional because it's triggered all the time and it starts losing its ability to know sort of right from wrong. And so this leaky gut is really important. And so um, I sort of talk about what it is and all the things that can cause it on this slide, but I only have a few minutes left so I'm gonna go quick. Um, you know, we wanna fix the leaky gut. And so really wanna talk about, I just explained to you how it, how it triggers inflammation. And so I just wanna to get to how to fix it, which is where we come to food. And I didn't, there was a food you mentioned I didn't know about, about uh, vanilla. Did you say vanilla is healing for the leaky gut? So I didn't know that. This is my list, you know, that I have my short, short list, and we can add to that. This is where Chef Delay can help me. Um, but we sort of fix the, the bacteria, and then we work with food. And food is food that's really, really healing for the gut line. Um, and so we work on healing that. And that's how we heal the immune system and help the immune system be really healthy. And so that's actually it. And so there's more information about if you want, if you need or you're interested in more information, especially about how to heal the gut, my chapter, I have a free chapter download for you on how to heal the gut, my whole gut chapter on bloodhealthmd.com. So you can download that and read all about how to heal, make sure you have a healthy gut and how to do that. And that's it. And always remember, if you do not change direction, you may end up with your head. Thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you. Well, we can do this. All right, we're going to sit up here and we're going to take questions. We were going to sit up there, but you don't have a mic. So you do want to stand and I'll stand next to you? But we're going to sit and make it really casual you know, and relaxed. But um, so does anyone have questions for us? Yes. If you're not, oh, going to go around. This is the time to just have fun and conversation. If you're not going to get your probiotics from food, how do you go about choosing the best supplement? If you're not getting it from food, how do you choose the best supplement? So my suggestion for that is to choose something that has multi strains. I think there's a lot of research being done, and actually, Chef, you might speak to the lactic acid stuff that you're aware of. But the way that I tend to work with that is to um, multi-strain formulas. 
So several different lambda bacillus, several different bacillus, because we're learning they all have very specific functions. But, and, and there's research coming out that's trying to say, for women, take this one, and for, you know, this kind of goal of depression, take this one. I don't think there's enough research yet to really do that, so I, for inflammation and general immune health, a mixed strain, something that's mixed strain. I can answer that too. I mean, basically, it starts with your balance of your body. So if you have SIBO, small intestine bacterial overgrowth, you have to understand that you don't want to feed that. So the probiotics that you're taking could feed the bad bugs. So first of all, you have to find out where's your, where's your body, where you're stable. Keep in mind that most probiotics are dead in the stomach. You saw it's 1.5 acid. So fermented foods can survive into the small intestine still alive. So you want to learn more about fermented foods. Keep in mind lactic acid bacteria. That is most important. And if you look at the French and Europeans and Asians, they don't eat a giant plate of food. So they eat small portions, keeping the stomach acid level that Susan showed at a high acidity level. So all this stuff doesn't get into there that requires you to rebalance with pro and prebiotics. So they eat a small portion of food, they stabilize a high acidity stomach. Big portions of food you're going to push into high alkalinity. Stuff can pass through the stomach that doesn't belong in the small intestine. So you have to eat slower, smaller portions. The body is not designed, we didn't feed like a feast and run off to the next thing or watch TV. We actually eat and celebrate the food. And the last thing is, try to eat at least 30 kinds of food a day. 30 kinds of food a day. That's a normal person's diet in Japan and Europe. And just little bites. And don't eat all day long. Every time you eat, your body is saying, store fat, store fat. So try to fast a good period of time. And when you start eating food after a good fast, how does the first food make you feel? There is no measure really to explain to you which probiotics you should be taking. Everybody in this room has a different group of bacteria. How can there be one to support all of us? Do a fast, see how the food reacts to you when you come back out of the fast. Then you'll have a better measure. You've got to find a measure that can do it. There isn't an answer 100%, but you have to work with your own body. It will tell you what you need. That's a good way to think about that amount. So if you're trying different probiotics that you're actually buying, see how you feel when you take it, and you might see whether or not it agrees with you. How many grams of sugar should you have a day? How many? How many grams of sugar should they have uh -huh. a day? Zero. <laughs> you don't need sugar. It's in, I showed you. You never think there's so much sugar in garlic. Sugar is in every single cell everywhere on the planet. There's no reason to put more sugar in your body. So I hope that so seems like a well, if you're going to eat like, certain uh, foods that have high sugar without fiber, and then there's all kinds of sugar, your question is great. Study the different kinds of sugar first, and then decide how much of each kind. But it's going to come from natural berries and, and different kinds of sea fruits and things. You have to be careful how much you eat of that. Because, again, sugar is in everything. But never add sugar. <laughs> Wean off. And if you have to have sugar, Coconut cane sugar. I was going to ask you that. It's only 30 on the insulin index. White sugar is 120. Coconut cane sugar has something called potassium. It has something called vitamin C. And it has something called fiber. So coconut cane is the only really safe sugar supplement. Yeah. Someone. So are you saying even honey is not good? Certain people can't metabolize honey. So you have to understand, you know, we all live in, like Susan was saying, an ecosystem. And sugars are all different. You know, we got a little bit confused in our country because they went from physics to physiology. They took a steak, they burned it, look at how many calories this is, and they think it converts to physiology. So if we eat 500, gram, 500 calories of of broccoli and Brussels sprouts and everything. We can't, no one says you can eat 500 calories of crap. That's not how it works. 
and you're still at 1,200 calories, but your body is saying, wow, why'd you give me that 500 calories of poison? So honey is, you know, Manuka honey is one of the best, because it has, has um, antibiotics, it's probiotics, prebiotics, it even has um, things that will help you kill bacteria. So, but you have to study if you can metabolize them. There isn't, we all different bodies, you know, see how you feel. If you, if you can't metabolize it, would you get digestive symptoms, do you think? I like think, would somebody know by eating it, whether they... Yeah, I think that they would find, you know, again, how, how much are you listening to your body, how you react to it. That's why I say the best way to lose weight is to fast. We did that since million years. All our religions did it. We don't do it anymore. Fast 12, 18 hours. Saturday night, don't eat until Sunday night. First food you eat, see how you feel. Write a list. Do I feel good with this? Do I not feel good with that? And then build your log book, and off you go. Back to personal life. <laughs> no, it's for everything needs to be personalized, because everybody's yeah. different. We only have 10% of the same bacteria, I believe, yeah. in our bodies, right? So how can there be something for all of them? To eat? We have time for one more question. Okay. Somebody how many meals did you have a day? You guys are at the table now with the right questions. How many meals? Meals. I eat like no one. Answer, I'll I eat one one meal. Yes. Somebody said no. And I eat in a concentrated period of time. I don't eat for many, many hours. My normal, normal run of night eight is minimum twelve hours that I won't. And I, I, I feel the energy from that. So, you know, fasting is not only a way to lose weight, to use the stored fats that are in our body. Everybody thinks those stored fats are there to look pretty, but they're not. They're there to eat when, you're, when you can't eat. But also, as Susan could explain better, by only through fasting do we get out the expired cells. Every cell has an expiration date. Fasting allows us to get these out of our bodies so new cells can grow in us. Fasting is one of the best things we can do, and if you, if you think it's long, maybe not for your age. You don't need to fast, you're still growing, you're a little person. I, I, I probably ate like 30 meals a day when I was your age. But, you know, I'm older now. I don't need so much food. And I do, I'm a chef, so I smell a lot of food, I taste food. So I'm not the perfect person to answer. I think Susan... Well, yeah, yes. well, um, well, there's a lot of... Uh, there's a, the, one of the big um, current trends is looking at calorie restriction, intermittent fasting, and how many meals to eat a day. And I personally do eat from 11 to 7 and fast 16 hours. Um, but I eat three meals sort of in there, maybe. Like, so at 11 o'clock, I'll have what's my breakfast, and then at 2 o'clock, I'll have very light sort of lunch, and then I eat dinner at 6.30, and it's all be done by 7. And so I do eat three, really two meals and maybe a snack um, in those those. But I think three meals a day for someone your age or growing or in general, I think that there's no need to, unless you have diabetes or another reason that your blood sugar is not quite stable or another health issue where you get hypoglycemic, you probably want to just eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Maybe if the difference between lunch and dinner is so long, then maybe a little afternoon snack if you can't go more than five hours. But I think what we're learning is unless you're that person who's hypoglycemic and needs to eat more often, three meals a day. You know, um, and if you're interested in the health benefits and the metabolic benefits of calorie restriction, which is just time restricted eating, I think the 16 hours, the eating for seven, you know, from 11 to seven or whatever your eight hours are, eating eight hours and fasting 16. But we really are learning about the health benefits of this idea of fasting. And there's many ways to do it that all end up at the same place. You can do where like two days a week, you skip a whole day or you eat 600 calories or just eat one meal. Um, or you can do this kind of thing where you do the 11 to 7 in an ongoing way. Or maybe it's 12 to 8 for you, you know, depending on what your day's like. So, but I still, um, I, I think coming from the, babe, the mouth of babes, I would say three meals a day for, you know, growing people, folks. But, you know, once you get to a certain age, if you're looking for the benefits of replicating your mitochondria, anti-aging, and increasing your telomere length, um, reversing, car you know, uh, cardiovascular and other health issues, reducing inflammation, losing weight, this whole thing with the, 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 the calorie, what happens when you time restrict eat or you fast intermittently, you do restrict your calories. It just happens by, by virtue of that. So I think there's a lot of health benefits.
right. however you do it, and there's a different way to do it depending on what works best for each person. Well, so we get into a ketosis, so we get into ketones. Right. So the brain loves that more than sugar. So. Yeah, I think that if there is a takeaway, we'll run off now, is to think about how food services you and make those decisions independently yeah. and find the cleanest food you can find, always in season, and, and just enjoy it. Local thank you. Fantastic. I, I'm now worried because I've been eating chocolate almonds to go to bed and I, I, I've never fasted. I have work to do. I, did I say we're in a constant state of learning? Okay, number one, you can make a donation at your table. Please consider that. Number two, you can volunteer with uh, we or you can volunteer with Mon, uh, Monmouth Medical Center. And number three, you can make one change and that change could change your life. So thank you guys so much. Uh, of course, you know, you guys can head upstairs now. Uh, more activities upstairs by the vendor space. And thank you so much for a wonderful lunch.